Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to tonight's um, calf care webinar in association with Chagisk and Animal Health Ireland and supported by Volac. So we were planning to be on farm for these events, but unfortunately COVID got in the way again. Uh, and we're bringing you an in as our program that we had planned for on farm uh, by means of this webinar tonight. So tonight's proceedings is going to be divided into two sections. So with the first section, we're going to focus on colostrum management and housing, and we are joined by a panel here in the studio, which we're going to discuss that. And then in the second half, we're going to discuss pain management in relation to the young calf, and also uh, an ever increasing issue seemingly uh, in relation to bloat in calves. So uh, I'll introduce my panel first here. I'm joined on my left-hand side by Philip Donoghue, who's a dairy farmer here in County Carlow. Uh, beyond Philip is Kira Hayes, who's a member of the technical working group with Animal Health Ireland in relation to calf care, and is also a vet with the Department of Agriculture based in the regional lab in Cork. And finally, I'm joined by Emer Kennedy, who's a research officer with Chagask and is also a member of the technical working group with Animal Health Ireland in relation to calf care. So um, tonight we're going to talk about colostrum. Um, now we've talked about, a lot about colostrum in the last number of years in relation to calf health and we can see from reports coming from the Department of Agriculture in relation to the disease surveillance that our levels of calf care are improving and the quality of the feeding that's going into calves is a lot better. However, we can still always improve. So tonight we've asked the Emer to talk about the storage and collection of the colostrum piece as opposed to the actual one, two, three. So I'm going to hand over to Emer to talk about the collection and storage of colostrum for optimum effect. Thanks, Thanks Stuart. Good evening, everybody. Colostrum and hygiene. To me, these are the two key factors which are going to keep your calves healthy for the coming spring. So if we think about humans, when babies are in utero, there's no transfer of, there is transfer of antibodies between the mother and the baby. So we are born with a developed immune system. However, when the calf is in utero, there's no transfer of antibodies between the cow and the calf. So this means that the calf is dependent on colostrum to develop that immune system. Now, if we think about firstly where the calf is born, this means that if the calf has an underdeveloped immune system, it is critical that it is born into a clean environment because if it isn't, it's at risk of picking up any bugs that are in, in that environment. So just to recap on the colostrum one, two, three. And again, if you, if you can just keep this in your mind every time a calf is born, I think it's a really simple way of remembering exactly what to do. So the first milking, one stands for the first milking and only the first milking, because this is what is colostrum. Milkings two to eight are transition milk, and they do not have enough antibodies to give to the calf for its first feed. Only that first milking, the colostrum, contains enough antibodies to kickstart that immune system. Two, that means to feed within two hours of birth, because this is when the absorption of those antibodies is maximum um, and it decreases over time and falls off pretty rapidly until the calf is 24 hours old when it can't absorb any more antibodies from the colostrum. However, that said, there is still a benefit to feeding transition milk because it can line the gut and help against scour. And three, this stands for feeding three litres. And by feeding three litres, that will ensure that the calf is after receiving enough antibodies to get that immune system going. So when we talk about um, producing high quality colostrum, again, we're back to the hygiene. Hygiene, hygiene, hygiene. We need to make sure that everything that we're collecting the colostrum in is spotlessly clean. And equally, anything that the calves are fed their colostrum through, or their milk for that matter, is also spotlessly clean. I'm sure we've all been on farms where we've seen buckets that are filthy, dirty, with lots of bacteria and fungus on them. You can imagine with that buildup of bacteria, it's going to go against the calf in terms of their health. So what we're looking for is very clean equipment. It was actually very interesting in a recent survey that we did when we went out on farms, we took samples of the feeding equipment for calves um, that were fed. So buckets, bottles and teats, automatic feeders, and the dirtiest pieces of equipment that we found were actually the stomach tube and the bottle and teat. The very first thing that that calf is fed with, the colostrum going through it. So if there's one thing that you do this year, it's to make sure that those feeding implements are cleaned after each use and spotlessly clean at that. So to look at the factors which affect colostrum quality, I guess the main one um, that we need to consider is time from calving. So as 
as the cow calves, when the cow has calved and as the time progresses on, the, the cow signals have been sent to the brain for it to produce more milk, which is essentially diluting down the antibodies. So we have a nine hour window where we can collect that colostrum because after this, the quality begins to reduce and doesn't contain enough antibodies to feed to the calf for its first feed. So for example, if you have a cow and she calves at eight o'clock at night, and isn't milked again until eight o'clock the next morning, the quality of her colostrum will be a lot lower than if, say, for example, she, she calved at five o'clock in the morning and was milked uh, again at eight. The next factor which can affect colostrum quality is lactation number. So often it's said that heifers' um, quality of colostrum is a lot poorer than mature cows. However, this is often not the case. We have found in many of the, the um, experiments that we've done that heifers have good enough quality colostrum to feed to the calf for the first feed. But the only way you're going to know this is by checking the quality. And we'll come on to that in a moment. The next factor just to be aware of is month of calving. So in general, from studies that we have done in, in Chagas Moor Park, we have found that the later calving cows, so cows calving, we say in April, May, that the quality of their colostrum tends to be lower than cows that calve earlier in the season. So one thing that you can do is when you're at peak calving and there's an excess of colostrum, you can take that colostrum and store it in, in the fridge or in the freezer. And the last thing just to be aware of is the volume. So cows that produce a higher volume generally tend to have poor quality colostrum. But again, we're not going to know unless we test it. So there's a very simple cheap tool that should be part of your equipment for the calving season. And that's called a Brix refractometer. So you can get them and they're less than 50 euro and they can be easily purchased online or maybe some of the co-ops have them in store. And the way they're used is that you take a few drops of colostrum, place it on the refractometer, look through the eyepiece, and then you will see this scale. And the, the refractometer you want goes from zero to 30. And what you're looking for when you look through the eyepiece is how far that white or the, the lighter color comes up. And what we want is a value of 22% or greater. So once it's 22%, that means that there is enough antibodies in that colostrum to feed to the calf for its first feed. If there isn't enough antibodies or if it's below the 22%, don't feed that as a first feed. You could potentially keep it and feed it as a second feed. So once we have determined the quality of colostrum, we know that we're going to feed it within two hours and we know that we're going to feed three litres. However, you know, a lot of people store their colostrum. So what we want to, to just make sure is that if we're storing that colostrum, we're doing it correctly. So we're getting the maximum benefit out of it. So colostrum can be stored in a fridge or a freezer, but the key thing is to store it within three hours of collection, because after this, the bacteria in the colostrum grows exponentially and it essentially binds to the, to the antibodies and then they can't be absorbed by the calf. So for that reason, we're saying into a fridge or a freezer within three hours. If we put it into the freezer, it will last for up to a year in the freezer and in the fridge, it will last for up to 48 hours. And the key is if you're storing it in your fridge in bottles that you write on the bottle the day, the date, the time that it goes in, for example, the 18th of January, AM or PM, and that you're checking that fridge every, every day or twice a day, and you're just throwing out anything that is over 48 hours old, because once it goes over the 48 hours, there's too much bacteria um, on it for the calf. So freezing colostrum comes with a warning. And that is around defrosting. You have to be very careful how you defrost um, your colostrum. So no boiling water and no microwave to, to, to defrost it because you're at risk of killing the, the antibodies. So what you can do to defrost it is you need to keep your water at less than 60 degrees. Um, if, we, if you look at the pictures that are on screen, you can see it can be frozen in either um, a bottle or a bag. With the bag, there's a greater surface area, so it's going to take a lot uh, less time to defrost than if with the, with the milk carton. Because if you think the thickness of that and how long it's going to take to defrost into the middle, it'll take quite a while. But a word of warning with the bags, don't put the bag straight into water because there's a high risk that the corners have, have frayed and then the colostrum can run into the water. A good idea is to get a steel bucket, so get a larger steel bucket, fill it with um, warm water, less than 60 degrees, put a smaller steel bucket into that and um, put your, your colostrum into that. 
After 15 minutes or so, you can change the water again, and that will make sure that you're, you're speeding up the, um, the defrosting process where possible. And finally, just to finish by saying that antibody absorption is increased when um, colostrum is fed warm. There's no problem feeding cold milk as long as you're consistent in what you do, but colostrum should always be fed warm. Even if it's coming out of the fridge, it should be warmed in the method that I just went through to, to defrost, and that will ensure the maximum uptake of antibodies. So at this point, I'd like to wish you the best for the forthcoming calving season and hand back to Stuart. Thanks, Emer. So I suppose there's some interesting points there in relation to obviously following through on the one, two, three of colostrum, Emer. And one question that's just come in there and we would encourage people that Emer and Kira will be leaving us halfway through the program. So if you do have questions for them, please put them in immediately. Is three litres actually enough for the newborn calf? So how you can work it out accurately is that it's eight and a half percent of birth body weight. So for a 35 kilo calf, which is a typical birth weight of a Holstein Friesian, um, we'll say in, in well, from the more part card, people know what those type of cows are. Our average calf weight would be 35 to 38 um, kilos. So three liters is sufficient for those. If, for example, you have um, a Jersey, a purebred Jersey calf that's maybe 22 kilos when it's born, or a heavy Holstein calf that's 60 kilos when it's born, if you work out at eight and a half percent of their birth body weight, that will give you the, the accurate amount to ensure the maximum uptake of antibodies. Okay, so it'll vary from her to her, obviously. So yeah, okay. but three litres is a very good guide and, and a very easy way to, to remember. Okay, so I suppose this comes to the storage piece. This question is, um, what will you feed for the first feed if the value for the colostrum isn't good enough when you test it? If you've no other colostrum source, we'll say available to you. So it comes back yeah. to having some stored from the previous year. Possibly. Exactly. So like, for example, this is something that might often happen at the, the start of the season. If, if uh, one of the cows calves, particularly heifer calves ahead of time, their colostrum may not be good enough quality. And again, that is where, where the, the colostrum storage comes in. So as I said, when you hit peak calving, you can store your um, excess colostrum in bags or cartons and put it into a, a freezer and it'll last there for up to a year. So for example, we have um, several, several bottles of colostrum on hand from last year um, that we have already defrosted and used for, for newborn calves. Okay, and just I suppose <clears throat> on the comment in relation to the plastic bags, there's a plethora of products now that you see online, various and in different being advertised in various places. Bags for storing colostrum would they be a worthwhile investment for people in terms of that they won't have that leakage potential possibly? Yeah, there there, there is there is that. Um, again, uh, there are systems there that you know the sky's the limit, I guess, with with cost. Um, but you know we can do it as cheaply as you want, or to to get specific. Um, products as long as it's put into the freezer within three hours to minimize the bacterial growth and defrost it properly and um, there should be no issue. Okay so we'll come back to what Emer has been talking about there but we just want to show you a video from Philip Donahue's farm so we were on farm with Philip earlier in the week and we're just going to run through what Philip's system is and it kind of sets up the conversation that we can have with Kira Emer and Philip here when we come back to the studio. <laughs> We're here in the Cavern Shed on the farm near Gores Bridge, where I farm with Kevin Hennessy. We milk 180 cows with 190 to calve down. 165 of them should be calved by Patrick's Day. Uh, in the Cavern area here, it's a big group, a uh, couple of big group pens where we can keep about 50 cows, uh, which they come down about a week before they calf. And then uh, just before the calf, uh, they move into the Cavern pens. We have three Cavern pens here behind me, and they move in there for calving. When a calf is born, she'll get uh, three litres of colostrum, uh, probably within the first half hour of birth. Uh, if she drinks that colostrum by, uh, from a teat, she'll get it, for, she'll be offered it from the teat first. If she fails to drink it from the teat, then we'll use the stomach tube to give it to her. During the day, that colostrum will come for, uh, from the actual mother of the calf, and the cow will be brought over to our old milking parlour, which is right beside the calf and shed here, and she'll be milked during the day, and we'll use it to feed the milk to the, to the calf from the dam. But we'll also store some of that colostrum for use at night times. So we keep a, a store in, in a fridge that we have in our, in our old dairy. Uh, we have a chest freezer and we also store and freeze colostrum for use when, when, um, when fresh colostrum is not available. The next stage then for the calf is that she moves on from the, um, uh, from the calving pen into, uh, into smaller, group, smaller tree group pens uh, where she'll be with two other calves. 
Um, here, she'll spend about a week on a straw bed where she'll be um, trained uh, on to teat feeders. And we use compartmental uh, teat feeders so that we can identify the slow ones and uh, deal with accordingly. The next stage then for the calf is that she moves into uh, group hens of 10, where they're fed with um, whole milk on a 12 teat feeder. Um, um, after about a week of that, then they're transitioned onto um, a quad feeder with 50 teats out in the yard. So we let them out, uh, out from the pen into the, onto the quad feeder, again, trying to transition them for the next stage. The next stage then is we let the calves out to a small little training paddock that's well fenced uh, with electric fence to get them used to that and used to grass. They have a run back into a shed from there. And for feeding, we bring them out through the gate onto a roadway where they can access the quad feeder. From the training paddock, the calves are then moved to um, other uh, suitable paddocks uh, where they stay until they're weaned at approximately 12 weeks of age. Okay, so Philip, that's a, an interesting piece of video there in relation to how you've adapted your facilities, we'll say from your original farm to the expanded farm that you have now. But I'll just pick up following on from what we were talking about with Emer there in relation to the storage. You, um, you had purchased a, a fridge freezer last year, but you've actually gone a step further now this year and you're purchasing a chest freezer. Can you explain the rationale for doing that, please? Yeah, that's right, Stuart. Yeah, I bought a handy size, I suppose, combination fridge freezer uh, last year. And while that was very suitable for stone fresh pieces for the, for the 48 hours, uh, we found that the actual freezer part was, was inadequate. Uh, and we misjudged it completely because I suppose as, as calving um, uh, progresses and it slows up, uh, we were finding the, you know, we could easily go 48 hours without a cow calving. And then if, if she didn't de uh, deliver beasts, we needed to go to our, uh, our frozen supply and we just, we just didn't have enough and we didn't have the storage uh, uh, capacity uh, to put in uh, the requirements that we needed. So, um, yeah, so, the, so the, the chest freeze would be bought now so that we at least, uh, um, at, you know, at, at peak uh, calving that we'd be able to put in a lot of surplus colostrum uh, into that frozen. And then it'll be there for the start of next year again, which typically when heifers calve down and while I uh, fully accept what Emo said that, that the quality can be good, but it's, it's uh, then making it available can be a, can be a problem. And, and at least we'll have that to, to fall back on. Yes, so we need plenty of room, that's right. Okay, and I suppose it's important to point out that you're a very compact calving herd in general. So that's what exacerbating your problem Absolutely. in terms of storage. The other thing that you said as well, actually in relation to that fridge, which was interesting was because I made a comment here that you had it for vaccines and so forth, but you actually have a different fridge for the vaccines because you make the point that with the best will in the world, that that colostrum fridge is going to get a bit dirty. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. For cleanliness, like, yeah. you know, and, and things like that. Plus our, our crush areas in a different part of the yard and and, and just for, for convenience as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, with, with bees and going in and out and when you're busy at that time of the year, there can be splashes and things like that. And then for, uh, we don't always get to clean it out as often as it should be. And, uh, but it's, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, basically yeah. just to, to keep that as, as good as possible. Okay, and just then um, your actual, you were mentioned there now about the tying procedure for, for the colostrum. What procedure are you using? I know what bugs people an awful lot is like the three o'clock in the morning, co calves, this idea of waiting around for a half an hour or 40 minutes for something to tie isn't a reality or isn't going to happen. So what way do you work? What, what we do is any cows that would calve during the day, we'd store the surplus colostrum from them in the fridge. And um, so at night time, then, um, if, if, if when a cow calves, uh, we don't go torn uh, beasts that we will have, uh, would say, a fresh supply there. And, um, uh, and again, it's, it's just a time management thing not to be doing it at that hour, the, the, the night nobody wants. But, but later on in the calving season, as I outlined earlier on, you mightn't always have uh, fresh beasts available. And um, to be honest, uh, um, We'd say I will watch cows. We don't have a night watchman. We're not big enough to, to justify that. So look, I will watch cows till till eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock at night. And if there's anything sick to calf, uh, then uh, I'm going to bed, right? And uh, if she's sick to calf, I'll stay. But if she's not, I'm going to bed, and we're back out by half six, and we will uh, we will talk then when when we'll have time and feed the calf. To any you know, um, any uh, which a calf that would have been born during that period more than likely will have been very near the morning time, and we will still be in the time frame to make um, to, to allow us to thaw the beasts and for the calf to get the benefit. Okay, Emer, just Stuart, yeah. sorry, I was just going to add on from that. I, we've done some recent research, so I think it, it's it's worth obviously the gold standard is cow calves milk that cow and feed feed the calf its mother's colostrum 
that's not always possible when you know you have a compact calving and, and you're busy so we we've done a recent experiment where we've looked at feeding calves once it's taken from healthy cows feeding calves either its own mother's colostrum or colostrum from another single dam and there's absolutely no difference in the antibody absorption so you're not doing the calf an injustice by giving a colostrum from another cow which is a good point to know so when you say healthy cow, cows now you're talking about yona's situation yeah. obviously which people are probably going to be asking or it's going to be popping into people's minds so just making sure that you're dealing with you know, as negative cows and that you're sharing that these things around it, then it's OK. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So the other question in relation to the absorption, just to pick up on that, the bottle or the sorry, the, the nipple versus the stomach tube. What's your preference or what's your thinking in relation to that? So um, just a couple of things on it. Um, Personally, I'd prefer to to start with the, the bottle and teat because, you know, it's, it's more natural and the calves get to get to suck. And I think, you know, if you if you make an effort to try and get to the calf within the first half hour, they're much more eager to suck at that stage and they're more likely to drink their, their three litres. However, if they don't drink it and um, then um, stomach tube them. So the absorption of the antibodies is slightly higher with the bottle and teat um, and with the stomach tube it is slightly reduced, but like the difference is, is, is quite small. And But the most important thing is that they're getting the correct volume in. So okay. however that's going to get in for you is the best way. Okay, so just I suppose um, following on in relation to your housing facilities, and as I said, you've adapted some of your existing buildings um, from the transition of the farm over time. Um, what value do you put on the deep bed of straw in, in the whole calving system that you have? And you can see from the video now that your facilities are very clean and ready for calves now. Um, but where, where, what does, where does the straw sit in your, in your uh, armory? Oh, I, with I, the... I think it's vital. I mean, we don't spare the straw. I know it's dearer this year, but what about it? You know what I mean? It, it can't be spared, um, uh, you know, for them. For, I suppose for hygiene, for warmth, whatever, you know. Um, so uh, we bed the calving sheds and uh, all the calving pens very regularly. And we always keep a good deep bed of straw and I think that's critical. Okay, Kira, just to pick up on that then in relation to nesting scores and just space allowances, like it's probably one of the key messages that we can give tonight. Nobody's going to be able to build a new calf house between here and the start of February, but just creating space wherever possible and making sure that the space the calves are in is adequate for the number of calves in that area is going to have quite a significant influence on how well that calf rearing season is going to go, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So the number of calves that are in an airspace is actually the biggest factor that affects the air quality um, within that airspace or within that shed. So um, the recommendations are that for calves up to 45 kilos, they have two meters squared each. Um, for calves up to, sorry, between uh, 45 and 100 kgs, um, they have their three meters squared and from uh, 100 to 150, they've got four meters squared each. So what you want to do is um, measure the area of the space that you have available and divide that by the number of calves that you have going into it. Um, and that'll give you a figure in meters squared per calf. And then if you're sticking to those space recommendations, you're not only making sure that calves have enough space to move around and to lie down, um, but also that um, you're helping to maintain the air quality um, in the shed as well. So, yeah, so really, really important to think about space allowances. OK, so I suppose it's important again to point out, you said the, the different weight bands there, like calves are going to be weaned at 100 kilos for the most part. So the four metres isn't going to be applicable to a lot of people. The higher space requirement is, is going to be applicable to farms that are keeping a lot of calves on farm. Yeah. In Philip's situation, you're moving a good few calves off the farm relatively quickly so you're only rearing your heifers is that correct correct yeah, yeah. The, the beef calves would be going about three weeks of age and, and we rear all the dairy replacements so you can standard. expand your space if you need but you have a lot of space for your heifers yeah anyway. and i didn't realize that the actual required <laughs> space was was as high as that um but in actual fact we, we'd probably be hitting those uh, parameters anyway uh, i actually thought i had surplus space um because we'd have um uh, we 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 pen the, the calves in groups of ten, and um, even though it would probably be close to to two square meters in that, these are for the young calves, I suppose maybe within a week. And um, uh, the reason we put them in ten, see, I would have thought it was room for twelve or that, and we have twelve teat feeders, but we would only put ten calves in just for 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 labour reasons. That if you have uh, ten calves to go to twelve teats, 
uh, they probably all get a teeth yeah. each, but if you had 12 calves, you'd have, have a spare teeth this side and a spare calf that side. So you have to jump in and put the calf around. And it's just for, for, um, for that reason, we would have a reduced number of calves, which, which I call tend to reduce number of calves. Yeah. And that would be allowing them about, about two square meters uh, yeah. at that age. Like, yeah. but, but I actually thought I'd surplus, but I don't have yeah. surplus. I'm just about just to like, mm. yeah. I think one of the big <laughs> things is being aware of the amount of space that you have um, and knowing exactly how much space your calves have because I you know I would go to a lot of people who have never really considered it so even just being aware of it measuring the space that you have working out your meter squared per calf in that space um is, is a really good really good start okay Kira. and just in relation to air space and ventilation and so forth first question I'll ask you is um which trumps like floor space or air space which one are we what like I mean, you 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 want both. Yeah. Um. Ideally, I would say that um for most calf sheds in Ireland, they're probably built to be able to take machinery in to to help with clearing out um at the kind of at the end of the season or, mm -hmm. or mid season. So most calf sheds are are going to be high enough that you have you probably have the the cubic airspace that you need. Um, but you you do you want to optimize both um, definitely it's pro as a starting point it, it's probably more straightforward to to work out your floor space yeah. and to start off with but I would say both are important yeah so I suppose generally what we would have found in the past is maybe if the floor space is overstocked it becomes too much of a pressure point for the shed the airspace of the shed yeah. whereas if we keep the the numbers in the, correct yeah. for the pen it, it ties in well with the, it means that there's probably a, more than adequate ventilation just in relation to inlet and outlet ventilation figures around that important ones for people to note yes um so this um i suppose just an important one from just to point out uh, in the booklet um that there is just a typo um in the in the booklet there in one of the um little bubbles so um the it goes into um uh, the the text uh, kind of goes into detail on it, but there there is a, a bubble there that um, states that the inlet outlet area is 0 0.8, um, and we're actually um, missing a, a decimal point there. So the uh, so so just to point that out to everyone, if you are looking at the at the booklet, um, so the minimum um, outlet area that you want is 0 0.04 meters squared per calf. So that's your minimum per calf. And then for your inlet area, you want a minimum of double that. Um, so that's where the 0 0.08 is coming from. So, so a minimum of double your outlet, and then your outlet is a minimum of 0 0.04 um, per calf. And ventilation systems may have a role to play for some sheds. As you said, sheds yeah. are modified maybe. Like Philip, I think yeah. your, your sheds, you're quite happy with how they work. Again, you while you they weren't purpose-built calf houses, you're happy with the way they work for you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the Frisian heifers, which which hang around for uh, obviously for uh, for a lot longer, uh, on, um, you know, they're in our older uh, calf houses, and and um, uh, because we rear the beef ones now elsewhere, um, you know, there's sufficient, uh, we'd say, space in there, and we're happy. The beef ones then are in a modified uh, slatted shed, uh, which is no longer needed, obviously, for beef enterprises long on the farm. And yeah, um, uh, and uh, assuming when that that shed was built to spec. Uh, back in the 1980s, uh, I suppose. Uh, well, I've never done the measurements. Um, I, I presume that it's it's right. We we don't have a problem with it, but we do use the the doors, uh, um, the sliding doors, and the under the centre passage. Uh, whether uh, about bad day, we might, some days it could be left closed, some days it could be left uh, completely open, and some days maybe halfway, depending on what type of a, a day it might be. So we do maybe do a little bit of adjusting like that so that we don't smell the calves when we go into it. But yeah, it works well. We didn't have to build a shed. Um, we used um, facilities that were on the farm. And lots of straw, as you said. And lots of straw, even on the slats, yeah. Yeah. Um, Kira, I suppose, just to pick up again on the, the housing element of it there, the um, importance of the floor, the fall in the floor for drainage, um, the nesting scores and so forth there, that deep bed of straw is so important. Um, what about the shelter element of it? And I think you've talked about maybe the role of calf jackets in if if critical temperature is dropping. But where, like, you can if you have a calf jacket on a on a calf, and but the, the bed is wet underneath them, what's the situation yeah. there? Yeah, yeah. So, um, if you if a calf is uh, sitting on a wet bed, 
they're going to lose heat much more quickly than if they've got a nice dry bed under them. Um, so that's one really important point is to, to make sure that the bedding is always dry. Um, the next thing then is around nesting scores. So what we're measuring um, with nesting scores is the proportion of the calf that is covered by the straw bed. Um, and that's giving us a good indication of how well the straw bed is insulating the calf, not only underneath him, but around him and helping to trap air and insulate the calf um, and create a, a little micro environment of, of warmer air for the calf. So what we want to see, um, I talk a little bit more in um, a short video and um, that's that will be available um, after the, the webinar, I go through the, the whole um, scoring system. Um, but what we want to see really are nesting scores of three, which means that when the calves are lying down um, in the bed, um, their, their legs are not visible above the straw bed. So that means they're nestled down nicely into the straw bed. They're being insulated from the sides as well as from underneath. Um, and the straw bed that, the, you know, the, the straw bedding that you're using, that's working as well and as efficiently as possible to, to keep your calves warm. Okay, so I suppose the, the, the take home messages out of the session from Emer's point of view would be that early well stored colostrum, well harvested colostrum in as early as possible into the calf. And then as we move on, keeping very high levels of straw, copious amounts of straw basically available to calves. So just one question to come in for you there, Philip, in relation to the calves going outdoors. Um, have they shelter access if the, the day is bad? They, they, they go outdoors at three weeks of age, approximately, and they go to, uh, which you saw in the video, they go to a little training paddock first, and from that, they have access back up a ramp in the door, and it's back into actually to the slatted shed, and they have access to a part of that. After that, then, when they're trained into that, they, they then move out to other paddocks, uh, suitable paddocks around the yard, and uh, which wouldn't have a, a, a run back into them, but, but we're not prepared to leave the calves out in, in, in poor weather. So because we, um, and was highlighted in the video, we always bring the calves back to the yard or onto the road with the feed, and they have to come out the gap uh, uh, to get fed. So they're used to coming in and out. So if the day is bad, or if the forecast is bad, we, will, we won't let them back out and they'll have access, uh, they'll be put into a shed for the night, for the day, for two days if needs be, whatever the case may be, and it might be a different shed depending on which one is available. There's usually a number of options uh, at that stage, but no, not prepared to leave calves out in bad weather without shelter. And a question just after coming in there in relation to the calf coats, would you consider using calf coats? Um, I think what I've had is if it's, if it's not broken, don't fix. And I suppose, look, if you were thinking about leaving them out, uh, maybe I would. Right, you know, but because of what we do, and because it's it's such an easy job to bring them in uh, and, and put them into a shed, um, yeah, I, I, I'm I'm uh, uh, maybe I'm in denial from that. I know that the the theory is good about it, but like I said, if it's not broke, uh, don't fix. But I wouldn't say no. Yeah, you know, I'd never say never. Yeah, okay. And Eamor, just a final question before we wrap this up session. Up this session because it's come to a close very quickly. Question again in relation to the teeth versus the bottle. Two and a half litres by the, by the teeth, is that as good as three litres by the tube? Um, I think we're just better off to say stick to the three, three. litres, yeah. uh, to be honest, because it, it gets too confusing. Otherwise, like the difference is 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 minimal. So I think, think the absorption is the same and just feed three litres. So key messages from yourself in relation to the colostrum piece. Again, obviously one, two, three, but around the storage and the collection. Yeah, so hygiene, make sure everything it's collected into clean containers, stored in clean containers, stored within three hours. It'll last for up to a year in the freezer and 48 hours in, in the fridge. And Kira, comment in relation to one thing, I suppose, that people can do in the, in the next two weeks before things get really, really busy. Yeah, uh, so measure the area of space that you've got for your calves and um, work out how many calves are going to go into it and then use all the space that you've got as effectively as you can and just be aware of the stocking density in your housing. Okay, very good. So um, Kira and Emer are going to leave us now. Philip is going to stay with us and we're going to be joined by Yara Summers and uh, Liam Gannon for the second half. And we're going to switch now to a video that Yaris has done in relation to pain management in the young calf. So we want to desensitize the hornbud. For calves that are two weeks, three weeks old, this is a legal requirement, but it is best practice to do local anesthetic for calves that are debutted at any age. So this calf is about three weeks old. So we would have to use local anesthetic anyway, but even if she was a little bit smaller, a little bit younger, we would be using it. 
And what we're also going to use is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory as a longer term pain relief. See, the local anesthetic will only work for 70 to 90 minutes. And after that, the pain comes back. So by giving the calf uh, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, we actually give it another day or two of pain relief. Uh, and that really helps them in not getting a growth check. It doesn't put them off their milk. It doesn't, get, it doesn't diminish their appetite. So for injecting the local anesthetic, we take the horn butt, which is right here, and we take the corner of the eye and we draw a line between another the two. two. Along that line, midway, you'll find there is a bony ridge and just below it is a little divot. And it's in that divot that you have to inject your local anesthetic. Gently inject that. Now draw back on the plunger to make sure that there's no blood. And then you can gently inject this calf the four to five mLs. Now, obviously, that's only one side done, so you want to do the other side uh, for this budding both sides. Now, that needs a bit of time to work. So while that is happening, what you can do is already start up your disbudding iron. So whether you're using an electric one or a gas one, they need to preheat. So we'll start this up and let it get nice and hot. Keep it away from the straw, obviously. And what we're also going to do in the meantime is actually going to inject the calf with its anti-inflammatory. Now we're going to give this under the skin uh, and that will give us around 48 hours of it. Now this calf, the size of the calf it is, we're probably talking about one and a half ml. Now you can go in the skin, uh, under the skin in the neck if you can reach it, or if the calf is in the crate like this, it might be easier to actually go in behind its elbow. So we'll do that right now. So you lift up a good bit of skin and gently inject the calf there. Before we put the iron obviously onto the calf's horn bud, what we want to test is, is the local anesthetic properly working? So how we do that is we actually take maybe the tip of the needle and very gently where the horn bud is, you kindly touch that to the skin and the calf doesn't react at all. So that means that the, the, the horn bud is completely desensitized on that side and on this side. So very good. We know the local anesthetic is working. Another a way of checking is actually you can check the eyelids of the calf they get a little bit droopy um but that mightn't be as clear okay welcome back uh, to the studio here in oak park um as i said uh, philip dunner who has stayed with us to continue the discussions in relation to his calf management and now i'm joined by yara summers a uh, veterinary advisor with Lambia ireland who as you saw there in the video discussed uh, pain relief in relation to this budding in particular but also in general calf management and we're also joined by Liam Gannon from Volek. Um, so, Yaris, I just come to you uh, on, in relation to your pain management video there. The um, role of the, the anti-inflammatory in overall calf management, I suppose, even superseding that of the, the role that you've identified there with the disboding, it does, I think I heard you saying earlier, maybe in relation to scour even, that there mm -hmm. is a role for that anti-inflammatory. And in overall animal care, it's something that's coming to the fore a little bit more. So obviously in your role, you're seeing more and more of it. In practice, this is going to be advocated quite a lot more for people that maybe haven't come across it. You might just give us a bit of information in it. Certainly, Stuart. I mean, it is an anti-inflammatory pain relief. So anything that causes a little bit of pain or, or a disturbance in the calf, so to speak, an anti-inflammatory will help. It's the same as people taking an aspirin. Um, or an ibuprofen because they might have a headache or a, a sore elbow. It's the same thing. And you mentioned that their calf's cower is a very good example. During calf's cower, the calf has a sore belly. So giving it that pain relief will actually solve that problem for it. And the calf will be much more lively, much more eager to drink again, which is what you want during an episode of scour and the calf recovers quicker. And there's other events, obviously, in the calf's life that give it a bit of stress or giving them an anti-inflammatory certainly helps if you're castrating bull calves. It certainly will help them as well. And I mean, cows even, calving cows, they will benefit from an anti-inflammatory on point of calving or just after calving, just to recover that a little bit quicker. A case, a case of mastitis, exactly the same thing. Okay, so um, just before we came on air, we were discussing it there amongst yourself and myself and Philip. Mm -hmm. um, Philip, you, you said you've used some of those anti-inflammatories. It was kind of when we mentioned the names of them that they, you, they really kind of, oh yeah, exactly. You weren't really sure that they were anti-inflammatory as such. But Well, I wasn't sure whether it was a specific uh, drug that, that Yoris was talking about. Yeah. And uh, yeah, but I think Yoris, you said like it's, it's the general ones that we probably would have uh, in stock and we would be used to using anyway. Absolutely. And, you, and you'll recognize the names if, if, if we call them out 
that you'd recognize them. You know, it's, it's things like phenidine or, or ketofen or, or metacam or, or loxicom or whatever. They're all names that everybody is familiar with. And they're, they're the products we're talking about. So there's nothing strange about this. We've all used them and seen them before. Very easy to, to apply. Yeah, so, so or should they, they nearly be in every fridge, basically, for the calving season? Absolutely. I'd say they're, they're a handy bit of, you know, something to have around that you can use immediately if need, needed. Some of them have, a, obviously, a milk withdrawal if you're using them in the dairy cows, but in your calves, there's nothing to worry about. And most of them can be given either under the skin or in the muscle. So there really isn't isn't the reason not to be having them them ready to go, to go. Yeah. And equally, there are some that are actually non zero milk withdrawal as well, aren't there? There would be there would be something that that's very short, something like a keto fan yeah. would be would be very very easy for a milking cow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just in relation to the this budding, then Philip, um, you, I think you're using somebody somebody's coming in to do that for you. So we'll say in terms of the pain management side of it, obviously depending on the age of the calf, they're going to be using the anesthetic as appropriate. But is that something that you've done in the past in terms of using the pain management? Or is... Well, actually, for the last couple of years, I have been getting a contractor, like you said, uh, to, to the horn, the calves. And uh, yeah, look, it's, it's, uh, it's, I know while well, it's not yet a requirement, but it's something uh, that I have to talk to them about, um, uh, would say, for, for use for this year. Absolutely. OK. So again, as I said um, already, we'll come back to the studio to discuss further in relation to the pain management and Philip's practices on his own farm. Um, now we're going to just briefly move to Liam to cover a topic that has increased in, uh, in popularity, for want of a better way of describing it, in the last number of years in relation to bloating calves. So I'll hand over to Liam, who's going to describe the reasons for this and some of the corrective actions that people may take in order to resolve it. Thank you, Liam. Thanks, George. Good evening, everybody. Just uh, like to say a few words on trying to reduce the risk of bloat in calves. Since 2015, we've seen an increase in dairy cow numbers and also an increase in the, the whole area of compact calving. And so with that, we've seen to a fair degree an increase in, in the purchase of calf feeders on farm where about 20% of dairy farmers at the minute would be using the, of calf feeder, if not one or, or not two of an automated calf feeding system. Um, the whole idea of what's happened around this is that vets and regional laboratories are finding calves being brought in for post-mortems. And in some way, the calf feeder is leading to some way the, the element of bloat on the farm. Um, if we look at what bloat is, it's a multifactorial problem. It can't just be the gas that's been produced. It's a bacterium produces the gas. Normally, the likes of Clostridia bacteria, Cicinia bacteria, or it can be the ordinary good lactic acid bac bacteria themselves create, create the gas, or you're looking like Salmonella bacteria. But it's, it's not just one factor. It's not just the, ga the gas alone. It'll generally be a combination, maybe hygiene, ready fermentable carbohydrates, like a bit of starter feed going in, or just calves under stress, but there'll be two or three factors that come together that create the perfect storm. The two types of bloat that we're looking at is basically abomasinal bloat and ruminal bloat. Now, abomasinal bloat is basically the fourth stomach. It's the fourth stomach that the calf is, is born with, as such as the monogastric. The rumen is very small and not functioning. So basically all your milk, your, either your whole milk, your milk replacer is going into the abomasum, and the flow rate through the abomasum will tend to level, will, will tend to, to control the level of gas production within the abomasum itself. So what basically is you get the, the bacterium feeding on the sugars, producing gas. So we need to control basically anything that delays the abomasum emptying into the small intestine. If we look at the esophageal groove, um, we, we look at the esophageal groove, basically it bypasses the room and when the cows are drinking their milk feed. So you want good esophageal groove action. And anything that interferes with that would basically cause a, a leakage into the room and can, can cause rumen bloat in the very young calf. So abomasal bloat is generally under three weeks when there's no rumen. If you get a leak, a leak in the esophageal groove, you can get some rumen bloat on, under three weeks of age. But generally, rumen bloat is later. And the kind of signs you get with bloat you're going to get is either um, you're going to get a calf kicking on the flank, you're going to get grinding the teeth, and with the older calves, you're, you're going to walk in some morning and you're going to find the calf dead, four to five weeks of age, good, strong calf. So if we're trying to reduce the risk, we need to look at poor hygiene. Again, as I said, it's not just the, the bacterium that caused the gas. You need to look at your, your 10 teeth feeder, or if, you, if you're looking at what Philip has there, your, your, your 50 teeth quad, you need to, it's not just good enough just to rinse it out with cold water. You need to be looking at soaking it with the likes of paracetic acid, to a certain degree so that you get those teeth well, well cleaned out and also during the season to go through with those teeth and check them that they're not leaking and if, if the problem again with the teeth if they're leaking you're, you're not going to get good esophageal groove action with the calf the teeth the, the teeth are going to be letting milk out too quick 
and basically the, the, ca the calf when it goes to, to suck through the its esophageal groove, it's basically the milk is coming out too quick and it's going to leak into the rumen. In terms of calf feeders, you need to set up your your feeding programs on them in terms of, of the washing systems. So most feeders are set up to feed or to, to feed three to four times a day, but the wash system should at least wash twice a day, uh, maybe at two in the morning or two in the afternoon. But ideally, when you have a large amounts of calves on it, you need to be setting that to, to three washes. And you also need to be looking at the detergent that you're using, not to be using something that's in the dairy that's designed for a hot wash system. You need to be looking to, for something that will work at 50 degrees or, or less because that's the temperature the machines are, are, are going to, to wash at, no matter, regardless of brand. Um, in terms of poor colostrum management, what Emer was saying there earlier, you're looking at the one, two, three, three liters within two hours of the first feed. All I'd say to you in terms of, of um, uh, to do with bloat is that if, if you are using a stomach tube, just like Philip says, you want to be sure that you're using, you're replacing it if it's damaged and that you're, you're very careful using it, that you don't damage the vagal nerve that controls the opening and closing of the esophageal groove. Um, the final part of, of the, the risk on bloat in this section, looking at osmolality, and that's basically the solid contents of your milk and the flow of milk through the abomasum. And anything that delays the flow of, of your milk replacer or our whole milk through the abomasum um, is allowing bacterium time to actually multiply on the sugars present and giving you a greater risk of bloat. And if you have the likes of clostridium bacteria in there, you're going to get harmful toxins being produced that basically will affect the heart, the lungs, the liver of the calf itself. Um, if we're looking then in terms of trying to reduce the other factors, if you have feeders or even just 10 teeth feeders, you need to look at your mixing rate in terms of, of um, calf milk replacer. You won't just take it for granted, taking a scoop here and there, get yourself a, a, a good measure, get yourself a weighing scales, weigh out your, your 125 grams, weigh out your 875 mils of water and multiply it up. And if you're using the likes of, of a 45 gallon drum to mix it up in with a, with a, a mortar, a mortar um, whisk on it, basically don't put, in, don't put in too much water at the start, put in a one third of your water, put in your milk replacer and get it mixed up well so that you don't end up with milk, re milk replacer that's all kind of cruddy or clotted. So mix it up well, then top it up and keep your temperature right. Generally, we want to, to get a good flow of, of, of milk replacer or milk through the, the abomas and you're looking to have your temperature around 37, 38 degrees. If it's colder, it's going to take longer to go through and give bacteria more time to, to multiply. Keep your feed times constant. You know, don't, don't have them varying too much from day and night. Try and keep them, keep them settled. And in terms of, of your milk volumes, you're talking about generally three liters per feed. Uh, if you go higher, it's going to take longer for that milk. If you're going up to four liters, that it's going to take longer for it to go through the, the abomasum. Uh, quality calf ration, again, when you're starting them off, give them, give them a, a, a muesli type ration. It'll be high in molasses, but you'll have a lot of fermentable carbohydrate in it. And if you're using commuterized calf feeder systems, you'll find that uh, only one calf can drink at a time. So that in terms of the ration, you don't want it too palatable because they'll have access 24 seven to it. And they'll be standing around taking in the ration and, and on computerized feeders, you tend to find the ration intake is up about 10 to 15%. Additives, what we mean by additives there and how they may, might reduce the risk of bloat that if you are adding the likes of a, 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 an acidifier or a milkshake to your whole milk or milk replacer, that in turn will reduce the flow of milk through the abomasum and giving bacteria a greater chance to, to multiply. Uh, on top of that, it might be an electrolyte or it might be something the likes of a probiotic that you're, you're adding. So you need to, to look at what effect that's going to have on the osmolality of, of the, the total mix. Um, after that, what we're talking about, access to, free, to free, fresh water or free water choice. If you're, if you're moving from one season to the other on an automatic feeder, you know, you need to, as in the picture there, you need to drain down the system. If you're using an IBC or some other type of a, a water holding device, drain it down, disinfect it with your, your sterilizer, um, clean it out. You also need to be sure that um, if, you, if you're, most dairy farmers will always tell you that they don't have a problem with water pressure on farm. But if you're, if your plate cooler's running and you're washing up after milking, that's generally when calves will be in drinking and that's when the water pressure will drop. So if you have that type of situation, you need to have a pressurized vessel on, on farm to keep the pressure constant. If, you, if you're not able to get uh, two bar pressure, uh, regardless of whether it's a, a computerized feed or, or just your, your ordinary two liter bowl drinker, you need about 12 liters of water per minute 
to be able to give you two bar pressure. And basically when two liters go in and the car starts to drink, uh, it needs to be filling up fairly quick, regardless of whether it's the truck at the front of the house or the back of the house, the, 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 the drinking bowls have to fill quickly and they need to be at the front and you need to check them regularly to make sure that there's, there's no meal or, or no fecal matter building up in them because that again is, is, is going to give you cause for bloat. The volume of the milk fed, there's a lot of talk with, with accelerated grow programs. Generally, we're talking about 12.5% uh, is the standard type of solid levels for milk and milk replacers or feeding three liters morning and evening. But if we look at accelerated programs, we're going up to 150 grams or 15% or solids. And if we're looking at our once a day feeding type systems, again, which would be kind of a fortified milk replacer system, we're going up to 20% solids. So again, if you, the more you move up the solid levels, the slower the milk is going to go through the abomasum and the greater the risk you have of bloat. If you don't have your hygiene right and your management right, you'd be as well to, to feed seven liters and stick at your 12 and a half percent. If you can't be sure that you're going to get good quality water in to balance the high concentration you're putting through the abomasum. Group size, it, it was said earlier there, the ideal type of group size you're looking at is, is um, 12 to 15 cars per pen. But again, we're computerized feeders, we're shoving that to make the system economic. We're shoving it to 30 cars per pen in general, 25 to 30. Um, so that in it itself can create problems in terms of bloat. We need to be conscious that um, calves will be jostling to get into feed stations. So you can get calves going in and then getting poked in the side going out. And that is enough to, to create a kind of a, 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 an upset in, in the actual stomach of the calf and create gas, gas movement. We can also get it's areas if they're not kept clean around the feeder, where calves are picking up dirty straw with coliform bacterium on it. And then they're going into drink milk and straight away they're, they're getting problems with bloat. And you need to keep the water troughs and the milk feeding point a, a little bit of a distance away from each other because the last thing you want is, is a calf either get, drinking water and then going into to, to drink milk or vice versa that the esophageal groove might be functioning correctly. Um, big group sizes causes stress. So when, you're, when you have 30 calves in it, you need to be sure that you have a fairly decent feed plan in and that you have a, um, no drafts, good, good, good uh, cover of straw under the calves, just to keep the stress levels down. Other than that, Stuart, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. So that's uh, some interesting stuff there. I suppose, again, coming back to it, um, the perception may be that that may be an issue that's associated with um, feeding milk replacer, Liam. And again, in our conversations before we started on air tonight, Philip, you were saying that it wasn't something that you were even aware of, really, because it's not a problem that you really encountered in your own farming system, and you're feeding whole milk. But I suppose, just to, to clarify, as, we, as I said already, the hygiene levels of your sheds would, would indicate that there's a high level of hygiene on your farm. And is, that's a key point, Liam, in relation to the prevention of bloat, from what you're saying. And it probably ties back to what Emer was saying earlier as well, about the level of bacteria that they were finding in teats on the farm study that they've done as well. The importance of changing the, well, firstly, the importance of the hygiene in the overall system. And again, the importance of changing the teeth from one year to the next. Does, is there a role in that? Uh, there is. Like in fairness, Philip said up there, he's, as I said, he, it won't be just be one factor. It'll be two or three, three things come, come together and then the, 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 the thing will really kick off. Um, Philip's system is good. He's, he's using detergents. He's, he's sterilizing his equipment fairly regularly he's i think in fairness to you philip you mentioned earlier you're allowing the calves or sorry you're allowing the you're, you're allowing it to drain out through the trees to sterilize them so you know some people will just put clean it out with cold water and leave it at that but the problem is that you will get with your 10 teeth feeders a biofill them uh, if you throw, throw cold water in them first rinse them out then get lukewarm water to try and take that biofilm off the inside of, of the feeders itself. And you also need to be, to, to be sterilizing them, letting some of your, your, um, your um, parasitic acid that go out through the teats to clean them out and check them. Uh, I, know, I know you might think there's a cost involved in replacing all these teats, but if you get an outbreak of bloat on farm, it, it, you know, you're talking about very little time to react, but it just can put the whole shed completely wrong on you. Um, but the other thing is with, with the, the feeders, is to try and use com compartmentalized feeders because you like with one thing with computerized feeders, we'd see that some cows are drinking at over a liter per minute and some are, are drinking at 300 mils per minute. So if you're using 10 feet feeders and you're not compartmentalizing, 
You have some calves that are drinking two liters and some that are drinking four. And then that calf with the four liters, it's his, his abomas is going to take twice as long to, to empty as the other, but he's more prone. If he picks up dirty straw when he goes back into that shed, and then you have the bugs to feed on the milk sugars to create the gas that's going to give you problems. Whereas in fairness to Philip, he's keeping hygiene pre pretty good. So Philip, you were saying about the, the groups of 10 as well, that you've, uh, is it 10 or 12 of those groups maybe, or, um, but you've a teat feeder for each one of those separately. So you're not actually moving a teat feeder from group to group there. Yeah, yeah, situation. absolutely. I mean, okay, we try to do the, the simple things right. Mm -hmm. And even from the hygiene, it's not uh, because I wasn't fully aware of the, the problems with bloat. I mean, um, uh, the reason for hygiene was I'm very much afraid of a problem with scour. I mean, and, you know, and there, there's lots of mental, but yeah, we have, um, uh, we have a tea feeder for every pen that we don't, that we don't mm -hmm. move, uh, that we don't move around. So every, every pen gets the, it gets the same feeder. Uh, all the time now while they're not all com compartmental but what we do do is for, at the very young calves are trained in on on smaller uh, bunches and and they are compartmental and so if we do have slow calves we do try to match them uh, pretty evenly as, as best we can uh, at that stage and then they go on to to, to more group feeders uh, when they are um, uh, you know and, and batch near as we can uh, uh, even drinking and just following on from that again i suppose um Maybe, Philip, you can come in on this as well in a minute. But, Liam, if you're soaking in paracetic acid to clean teeth internally, what's the best way to rinse them to ensure no paracetic acid is left in there? Or does it actually really matter? Uh, you're, going to, you're going to be diluting the paracetic acid down anyway. It's not as if you're going in at a, a level that's going to burn something. You know, so, you know, if you're rinsing them off in water afterwards, it's, it's not going to cause any issue. Uh, with, with calf <laughs> feeders, you do need to take, within computerized calf feeders, you do need to take like you have you have 30 odd calves on one teat so you do need to take them off two to three times a week get into a good routine and have your your bucket there with your dilute parasitic acid in it soak them and get a spare set and swap alternative just carry you know carry two sets yeah i suppose in relation to the parasitic acid it generally evaporates away which is yeah. why we're able to use it in the milking machines so it's not a concern yeah. that way um just to I, I'll come to you, Philip, there in, in relation to your hygiene regime on the farm first. And, and I have another question for you, then, Liam. Okay, sure. We, um, um, I mean, the, the feeders get, get would say, um, washed with detergent about twice a week. Yeah. Right. You know, we don't do mm. it after every yeah, week. We, we use Milton uh, and we drain them out afterwards. I mean, wash with cold water first, uh, then warm water with, with Milton. And uh, yeah, but about twice a week. And you have kind of set days for doing that, generally um, speaking? Or? No, not really, I suppose. No, I suppose yeah. we probably should have. But you know, every maybe three days, that yeah. sort of time that we would look at it. Teats are changed every every year. Yeah. We have 150 teats and it costs four euros per teat. I don't know where the cost, you know, that's 600 euros, but I, I think it's money when spent. All you have to do is no matter how uh, clean you think you're doing or, or how good a job you're doing on hygiene, uh, you cut one of those teats open uh, before you start the next season and you won't be long uh, changing your mind about how clean they are. <laughs> Yeah, and I think that's a very valid point, actually, Philip, in relation to the feeder bottles, because again, coming back to what Eamor said, they tend, they're only feeding one calf, generally speaking, kind of at a time, so they might, whatever the herd size is, and there'll be multiples of those, but they don't tend to get changed at all. We, we can't we think about changing the teat, teats on the teat feeders, but not the actual speedy feeders, we'll say, that might be being used to feed calves. Yeah, and, and actually, just from a, um, a user point of view, the, the teats are different in that there's a bit uh, cut off, and it's very difficult to get those teats. It's actually, yeah, we twice, just change the bottle, twice, the whole bottle, twice. because you buy them cheaper. You know that the, the teat isn't fully round with this a bit cut off it to fit into the into, into the little bottle that's yeah. a pity you can't buy those yeah liam again coming back to a very valid point it's something that came to the came to our notice um only i suppose it was last year when the chlorine free regime came in obviously we're talking awful lot about higher yours you can relate to this now with, with the with the milk quality side of things with can be as well um the higher temperatures required for washing with non-chlorine detergents and people were using, as you said in your presentation, they are the same detergent that they were using for the machine and the calf feeders, and they just don't clean them at all at all. So it's okay. it's important to point that out. That, but what's your recommendation? I, I know there's a product that you that you do sell like that. Well, look, obviously, yeah, I I, I just go what your your you know what I mean. Your local co-op or merchant tells you, you know what I mean? Like, I kind of stay out with that. I'm not trying to yeah, yeah, give us hard answers, but you end up in political problems with different companies when you start giving recommendations, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. There, there is one down your country called Buy or Sell, right? So 
Uh, if you talk to them, they'll, they'll tell you what it is like, you know? Yeah, okay. So I suppose it's just important that uh, people are aware of that, that we yeah. say, especially Correct. with the chlorine free now, that they're not, they can't use yeah. that to clean a calf feeder because of the temperature point that you made. Yours, there's a question there in relation to the use of the pain management. Um, with the changes in the regulations coming in the future, is it going to be feasible for people to have that? Like I said to you, should people have a stock of it on farm? Mm -hmm. Is it going to be feasible for them to have that? It, it will be feasible. It will be feasible. I mean, without going into the detail of the, the new legislation and so on, and obviously we still don't know the full detail of the legislation, but it, vets will be allowed to prescribe to individual animals, but also to groups of animals. So your vet will be able to issue a script to the 2022 calves for all the anti-inflammatories and, and local anesthetic that you might need to do everything with those calves this calving season and and you can have all that in stock on farm for when you need it so there won't be any issue with getting the product uh, from the vet on a prescription not at all no. okay very good um liam there's a question here that from your presentation the automatic feeder isn't getting a great light shine on it in relation to bloat issues I, I, like I, to... I, well look at that call a spade a spade it, it's there's issues out there you don't want to hide from um, you know, it's it's they're, they're a great tool, but they're not for everyone. And you know, the feeder will do the job. But you, you, as I say to you, if you don't have good water pressure, and you you if you don't have your feed pan set up correctly, um, you know, if you're, if, if, if you're going, if you don't calibrate your machine regularly, well, then you will run into problems. If you don't have your cleaning regime correctly, you're going to run into problems with computerized calf feeders. And there's some individuals have taken their calf feeders out, but if you're talking about a labor saving tool that's going to work very well for you, it will do that job. But if you're not going to, you know, if you're not going to have your water pressure sorted, uh, if you're using uh, water softeners in your feeders, um, that can create extra sodium and create problems with the, the abomasal emptying. If you're, if you're pushing your calves too high on, on, um, uh, in grams per liter going in, um, set up wrongly, it can cause issues. But it's it's the only but right it's like every system you don't want two or three people running your 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 calf or an enterprise you better have one or two and know what's going on um but if you set it up correctly follow the correct device they're the best labor saving device you can put in there but they're not for everyone yeah philip you want to come yeah in? i just uh, i'd like to ask liam i mean you alluded to it earlier as Stuart. Uh, is is um is can blow up your problem in whole milk or is it, is it a powder milk issue and you also mentioned liam about uh, the volumes of milk so when calves uh, which I do with mine at a month of age, they, they, they will go on to once a day. Mm. Uh, so um, how does that play into the bloat issue? Some of the worst bloat cases in the country would be on whole milk. Uh, there, you know, there's, you, you'll see people from year to year where they'll, they'll actually feed whole milk. They'll, they'll go away from milk replacement and then they'll go on home and they still get the same problem. So it's not, it doesn't combine to self to whole milk, but the problem is when bloat does occur um, because of the compact nature of cabin, a vet is brought out because it's rapid death. The vet has to try and find a solution. His first solution is either the cast starter or the, the milk replacer. It might solve the problem, right? But maybe maybe the powder wasn't being calibrated right day one. Maybe it was, wasn't being measured. Now all of a sudden there's a bloat. Um, it, all of a sudden they're more focused on what the problem is, right? Uh, sometimes, no disrespect to our audience, but it can be hard to get a farmer to tell you exactly what went wrong at a particular time, you know, to get to the bottom of the problem. Uh, it could be student home for the weekend feeding calves, some little change that has just abruptly changed the whole regime, you know, someone else doing the feeding and they've given too much, not measured or something like that, Philip. But to, to answer your question, if you go to once a day feed, you're feeding home milk, so you're not, all you're doing is dropping the volume, you're not increasing the solids, whereas people that are using a powder type product, your, 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 your concentration is way higher, right? So what you're, what you're doing is you're trying to, you're trying to feed, um, you might be trying to feed 600 grams of powder in plus three liters of water. So you're going to be over 17 or 18% crude protein, right? Uh, per, per liter, whereas you're still only going to be at 12 and a half percent on your once a day feeding regime. So the concentration, it, it, there is, and, and, and again, look on, on once a day feeding systems, it's just like the 15% the protein accelerate ones, there is instance of bloat where people do once so they feed on 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 um, on milk replacer. But you, if you're trying to avoid it, they need to have access to fresh water, and they need to be grouped to size in order for the water to be there to dilute down the high concentration of the milk you're feeding. If, if loads of people do it quite successful, but if, if you come along and someone or someone that maybe 
um, your little calves pick the straw up off the ground and they're not taking it out of a, a straw rack, well, then they could be picking up the bacterium with this high concentration of, of milk that's being fed. You're creating the perfect environment for, for um, blow to occur, particularly if they, if, you, if they don't have access to water, and particularly with very young calves, if you're putting them on milk replacer that are not used to drinking water, and you, you try and go earlier on, you do run the risk of, of bloat. Um, now, if you bought milk replacer and put it through your, your whole milk to increase the concentration of it, then you probably would start to get issues with bloat, particularly with your 50 teat feeder, because you'll have some calves drinking at 300 milliliters per minute and some at over a liter. And so your concentration then would be up near the, the 18 or 19 percent. You would probably get bloat at that stage. OK, so um, the, if you get it, what either yourself or, or Liam, um, uh, what's the solution, I suppose? Like you said, it's rapid death. So if you spot this now, like how do we how do we solve it? Like? Or how do we go about it? as in solving the we see the stomach expanding in front of our eyes scenario now obviously you've alluded to yeah. all the things that we have to take off in terms of trying to solve the problem long term but the actual solution what if as a vet in practice yours if you were called into a firm what was your solution to deal with the bloat sadly enough there isn't a, a quick solution well there is a quick solution but yeah exactly try and deflate the calf but i definitely don't want to recommend that yeah um i mean that it, that's not the way to deal with this and, and the prevention of it is, is going to be the way to deal with it. Because once a calf has it, there's actually very little you can do to all of a sudden get rid of that bloat, especially if it's an abomasal yeah. bloat, the way Liam has described it. If it's, if it's a ruminal bloat, different scenario and the deflation and so on helps and works and you can you know, do it either by puncturing uh, or by a, by a tube that you go uh, down the neck to deflate the rumen, that's fine. But in the abomasum, that doesn't actually work. So from a treatment point of view, all you can try and do is actually get the calf to obviously take on water, right? So if you have to, you can, you can actually give it water. If you want to give it electrolytes, that's fine too. You can tune that into the calf, but you want it to, to pass along the milk that's being digested as quickly as possible. So some vets might give something that, that moves things along a bit quicker and, and speeds up the, the gut movement, really. Okay. And you might get milk that undigested milk that passes along, but at least it's out of the abomasum. And you stop this buildup of gas and in the abomasum and that could for some calves uh, solve the problem but for a lot of them you'll be too late okay yeah and even start to after that i'm going to go back on feed and cut the volumes yeah cut the volumes of feedback and then just check that you're 100 mixing it up at the correct rate get yourself a, a refractometer like emer was suggesting for the these things and have it for your calf milk replacer and check that you have the solid levels right that you are mixing it correctly um is 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 where you should should look and just check your hygiene that you clean sterilize everything down your your whatever the feeders you're using because there's a bug like it has to be a bug somewhere in the system it's it's not the sugars in the milk there the bugs are multiplying on it but the bug is somewhere within your setup and you need to you need to isolate where it is like if you bring the calf to the lab they will tell you that it's a, a, a clostridia type of bacteria that's present so it's not common in the feed it's it's been picked up either either um moldy moldy you could get it from moldy straw you get the smell of moldy straw you're going to that's going to be full of clostridia bacteria mm -hmm. and just purely by chance they're just pick, picking it up you know and and that's the bug and all it needs then is the sugars in the milk or the whole milk and it kicks off and if, if, if bacteria is the problem like do antibiotics play a part in the well, solution well that's a, that's actually a very interesting question because the, the clostridia that are being mentioned here they're part of the normal gut flora of these calves and it's just because there's so much the sugars in the milk that's staying in the abomasum for too long gives these clostridia this gut flora a chance to proliferate and cause the issue and yeah i suppose in a way antibiotics could be used because what they'll do is they'll kill off these bacteria the same reason that you know when you when you take antibiotics you should be eating some yogurt to re-establish your gut flora it's the same thing in the calf by giving them the antibiotics you were actually going to kill off but it's not something that happens instantly so as a treatment for bloat that won't work but there's some anecdotal evidence, I suppose, that uh, the Clostridia vaccines actually have a beneficial effect as well in preventing the development of bloat because these, you know, your black leg vaccines as they are, those are all Clostridia bacteria. So there is some, some evidence, and I think it's mostly used in, in, in North America. They, they, they tend to use these on the larger farms. There is some, some anecdotal uh, evidence there to, show, to say that maybe if you were to use the, the, the black leg vaccine in your pregnant cows, 
and then through the colostrum, the calves actually get antibodies against this, that that helps in, in preventing the bloat. Yeah. Still, still a lot to be learned about, about calf bloat, actually. Yeah. yeah, so Yaris, you brought up the term vaccinations there, and it's, it's come up as one of the queries as well in relation to what vaccines should people mm. be using. Now, it's a broad sweep of a rush now to describe what you have to do here, but what's your thoughts in relation to vaccination in relation to calf health, I suppose? Well, there is, I would look at the, at the vaccines in, in two, two ways, and I would say the vaccines that you give the dam before calving to boost the antibody level in the colostrum against specific diseases and the, the best known one is the scour vaccine obviously you know it, it boosts the, the 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 colostrum in antibodies against rotavirus coronavirus and e coli three quite important especially rotavirus very important as a cause of scour in calves and it really depends on on good quality man or colostrum management then in the one two three and so on um before that actually has any benefit so if you're not good at giving colostrum and, and collecting it and everything that emer went through there's no point in giving the cows the vaccine because that, you know, it's all going to go to waste. The Clostridia vaccine, potentially, um, you could argue that maybe the Salmonella vaccine could actually work as well uh, for calves, maybe of a slightly older age, a couple of weeks old, that might get a Salmonella scour. It could also contribute to extra extra antibodies uh, in, in the colostrum. And then there is your, your pneumonia vaccines, obviously, that you could give to calves, either intranasal ones or injectable ones. Uh, depending on how old the calf is and so on. But that really depends on the issues you might encounter in, on the farm. Uh, but I'd certainly look at those if, if you feel your maybe the stocking density is a bit high. There's too much air, uh, shared airspace between the older stock and, and, the, and the young calves. Potentially, you could be looking at, at these pneumonia vaccines, and there's, there's a whole rake of those, so I won't go into the detail of them now. Yeah, but I suppose the, the important thing, again, now it's a bit late, maybe, well, within reason, it's late for the scour vaccine, but maybe for those uh, pneumonia vaccines that you've spoken about, talk to your vet. And um, uh, your herd health plan, basically, what's that it. going to be That's for your herd? It's going to, like Philip, from what you're saying there, we actually have quite a, there is, of course, you know, but a, quite a, a, f a relatively trouble free kind of calf rearing situation. Now you're doing a lot of things right to, to make well, that happen. Had, I had a lot of trouble in the past, like, you know, and uh, I mean, if you have trouble, uh, we had a very bad outbreak of rotavirus uh, scour about six years ago. You don't want to go through yeah, that again, yeah, like, yeah. you know, and if you don't change something, if you don't do something to fix it, you're going to have it again next year. But while we still get a small level of, of scour, thank God, since, since then we haven't had any any major issue, but we have made a number of changes uh, to, uh, you know, and, and researched it as best we could to try and, and, and find out uh, the, the areas that we were poor on and and and, uh, and, and change those, you know, and, and hygiene and stuff like that, like was paramount uh, in, in that. Again, it was a number of of calves, uh, bunches of calves going through particular pens and things like that, just to reduce uh, all that. So we did make a number of changes uh, because we had problems. So okay. I don't think it has been a smooth sailing <laughs> far from it. <laughs> okay, look, we're running out of time, I suppose. Um, again, similar to what I did with Kira and uh, Emer as well. Um, in relation to the pain management, your, just comment on that maybe mm -hmm. specifically. Um, we say farmers should be looking at this on a more widespread use across the herd in general? Just I, I, I would recommend that you have a stock of anti-inflammatory ready. Any calf that's off form, give it a shot of this and it will really help the calf recover quicker. And obviously when it comes to specifically to this budding, there is definitely an increased amount coming from the marketplace in showing that there is adequate pain relief when you're doing something that's a planned intervention in a calf. That, that will cause pain. I mean, everybody's burnt their hands on a calf this budder in their lifetime once. That's that's why why we're talking about this now. Yeah, yeah and I suppose just to expand on that point a little bit now, because the, the in the past there might have been a tendency to give an, a calf that was off form a shot of an antibiotic of some sort. Mm -hmm. You're not you're talking about, what, as you said earlier, it's like taking a Panadol because you don't feel great. It's not an antibiotic. Absolutely. It's just a pain reliever. It is a pain relief, and one one shot might be enough. There's some of these if you give them under the skin, they last for two days. That's all the calf needs just to get over this this little bit of a you know he's bit off form yeah. and that's all the calf needs and it'll pick up on its own. There's no need for antibiotics. Yeah. Liam, um, I suppose a, a very similar trend feeding through from what Emer and Kira were talking about and what Philip has implemented on his farm in relation to the bloat side of things. The hygiene is critically important. Um, is there anything else in relation to bloat that you've seen that you've in, in your experience that people need to be keeping an eye out for? Um, just uh, it's 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 just in relation to the feeders right just when you're moving from one batch to another you don't want to take it for granted that the bulk density of the milk replacer is the same and if you're even 
if you're if you're mixing milk replacer 10 t feed or that if you're going down to the co-op and collecting 10 bags the next pallet that comes in the density of that powder can be different it can weigh differently so if, if you don't calibrate your machine if you're buying pallets and you move from one pallet to the other you want to be sure to recalibrate and likewise that's why i'd say to you with with, with putting in your jug to, to scoop out your powder um you, you could have 100 grams extra depending on the extra density of powder going out if you if you don't weigh your jug if you're buying 10 bags at a time you're better if you can in in terms of micro placer side of it anyway is to is to um to to buy a reasonable quantity at a time so that you at least you know the density of the product you're using and if your measurements right uh, that would be the the thing i'd say to you on it like you know yeah and i suppose the other thing as well is probably just getting as you said if you're changing from batch to batch but at least identify at least weigh when you're changing the batch batch right. because like practically it may not be feasible to be weighing out your milk replacer sure. every time but at yeah. least get know that that bucket is enough for so yeah. many calves and get those mixing concentrations right that's pro that's probably right. the biggest issue like as we as philip kind of said there earlier is was the blowout associated with milk powder but it's yeah. actually maybe the use of the milk powder rather than the actual milk powder itself is probably the bigger issue correct and, and just um like get your temperatures right don't don't you know keep your water volume stops small get a get a good mix up on it that's and keep your you know attention to hygiene and plenty of access to free water okay uh, like checking your water troughs is really crucial like um it's 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 worth a lot just to get into if you're clean your 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 10 teeth feed or or your stalin feeder you should be clean your your water water troughs as well it's all part of the room just about a routine get into it and stop fecal matter building up in them like yeah so i suppose as i said just before i asked you that question hygiene is the underpinning trend of yeah. all of these things here yeah. so right through from the collection of the colostrum all the way through the calf rearing process the as you said on the bedding that they're lying on the water that they're drinking the the feeding the feed stations that they're operating out of or the feeders that they're operating out so hygiene is underpinning a high quality calf care basically yeah. so look we've run out of time there's been an awful lot of questions have come in uh, similar to what we would have done with the dairy conference in November, we're going to follow up on those questions and they'll be made, the answers will be made available over the next number of days through the Chagas Daily um, application that's available to people. So we will follow up on the questions that have come in. Uh, thank you for tuning in tonight. I suppose I'd just like to finish up by thanking uh, the people that are involved in the background. So Declan McArdle, as always, and Padraig O'Connor, who's in the background here, making sure that this production is a success. We also have George Ramsbottom and Granny Dwyer in the background working in relation to the questions and operation of pre presentations and so forth, as well as the actual uh, coordination of the, the 14 events that were supposed to take place on farm and subsequently changing that to the webinar tonight. Um, finally, I'd like to thank my panel that were here, to, both Philip especially for coming in to us and, and sharing his knowledge, Yaris and Liam who are here with me now, and Kira and Emer who were on with us earlier. Um, I'd like to thank the co-ops for their support in, in running uh, what was supposed to be on farm events and tonight's webinar also. And thanks to Volek as well for the support of the event. And we would like to wish everybody the very best of success with their calf, calving season for 2022 and hope that you can all stay safe and well in the meantime uh, and all the very best with that. Thank you. Good night.